it is good to be in God's house. Amen? Amen. 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 I am glad about that. God, what a wonderful place to praise God in His house. And I thank the Lord for the testimonies this morning. way and everything got uh, a little bit misplaced. Uh, if you have your Bible with you this morning, please open up to Galatians chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 1 in just a minute. If someone were to ask you, what is your proof that you know Jesus Christ is saved? How do you know you're saved? That is the question today. <coughs> Paul gives us four answers how we know that we're saved, our proof that we know we're saved. And I'm only going to look at the first three of them. The fourth one starts in verse, uh, so we're only going to go through verse 5. The fourth one starts in verse 6, and he introduces it there, 6 through 9, but then it goes on through the next two chapters. So what is the proof that we know Jesus Christ as Savior? would be a lot of good answers. Paul gives us three here in the first five verses of Galatians chapter 3. Proofs of our liberty. If we're not saved by works, what proof do we have that we're saved then? If we're not saved by works, how are, what is our proof that we're saved? Well, let me start out by a little introduction. In the first two chapters, Paul gives us his personal testimony. It's about him. The, the first thing he says, he's an apostle. Then he tells the Galatian church about his salvation experience on the road to Damascus. How that he spent three years in the Arabian desert close to Damascus. He would come back to Damascus to preach. Being instructed by Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? Seeing Jesus with your own eyes. Not, not uh, like in a vision or a dream. But Jesus taught him the Word of God for three years. Wow. Then he gives a description of what happened in Jerusalem, how that they go up to Jerusalem for this great big conference, and uh, about whether or not men have to be circumcised or keep the law if they come to Jesus Christ. They said, no, they don't. And then what happened in Antioch, the third largest city in the Roman Empire, and... Uh, how that he confronted Peter face to face. And that's what we looked at the last two times we were in together on Sunday morning in the book of Galatians. So that's all about Paul. It's very personal. In fact, in our outline, that's what we call this uh, uh, personal proof. The next two chapters are doctrinal proof. But before he gets into all that doctrinal proof about the Word of God, he tells us some proofs that we have in ourselves that we do not have to keep the law to be saved. In fact, uh, I'm going to back up a little bit in chapter 2. When he's confronting Peter, he says two things that are still some of the most deep and yet clear doctrine of the Christian church today. Look at chapter 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified, not cleansed, by the works of the law, but by the faith, in Jesus Christ. Even we, he's talking to Peter, we that, are, that were Jews by birth have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified just as if our sins had never happened. Jesus doesn't just put a little wide out over top of your sins. He tears up the page. He burns the page. Just as if we had never sinned by the faith he repeats that, by faith, that's how it happens, of Christ, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So that's one thing he tells Peter. Peter's agreeing with all this because Peter preached this on the day of Pentecost. <laughs> Peter preaches in Acts chapter 10. The same message. But then he says something about sanctification. After we get saved, how do we live right? 
Look at verse 19. For I through the law am dead to the law. We don't live right by the law. That I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Here it is. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. And I love the King James. You see that ETH at the end. It means <laughs> continuous action. Jesus continues every day to live in me. That's how we're sanctified. So let's read our text for today. Verses 1 through 5. And we'll look at three proofs. That we no, but we have been justified. That we're saved by faith and not the law. Oh foolish Galatians. So even though he's talked about what's happened in some really big cities in the Roman Empire. He's talked about what happened to him at Damascus. What happened to him in the holy city of Jerusalem. And what happened in Antioch. Which is as I said the third largest city in the Roman Empire. But also the largest church. A church of thousands and thousands of believers. Now it comes back to Galatia. Now Galatia is not a town. It's be like you, you wouldn't write to Jaeger or Gilbert or Welch or Williamson. You say the southern West Virginia. Galatia is a province, an area. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only what I learned of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, <coughs> are you now made perfect by the flesh? That's a good question to ask today, isn't it? Are you so foolish, mind muddled, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? And then Paul has this hope. If it be yet in vain, I'm praying that it's not in vain you receive this. He, God, therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now here we have these questions here. These rhetorical questions, because everybody knows the answers to them. But he asked all these questions. Proof of our liberty. Proof of our salvation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray today that even though we're very small in number today, let our hearts be very open and very wise to you. Thank you, Lord God, for your testimonies today. Father, how they encourage us and challenge us. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You are a good and a mighty God. Bless us, Lord God, that we would be faithful to you to the very end. Help us, Lord God, to lift up your holy name. Send a revival, Lord God, to this church, to our hearts. Begin the revival in our own kitchens, in our own living rooms. Revive us, Lord God, to be on fire for you. Lord, we do love you and we praise you. Father, we thank you for what we're about to receive from your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Proof of our liberty. First proof is this. Jesus Christ. Proof from Jesus Christ. The Messiah, the Savior. Verse 1. He's going back to Galatia, bringing them back from those foreign cities that he's been talking about for two chapters, several paragraphs. <clears throat> oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? That's two good words there. Foolishness. Foolish and bewitched. Now, he's not calling them fools. Let me start out by saying this. It's not the word morona, where we get our English word moroni. It's not that word at all. It's a word that means to be tricked in your mind. To be, uh, I wrote down several, lazy mentally. Not, not stupid. It's not anything, anything to do with intellect. Okay? To be clouded with doubt. Oh... Low thinking Galatians. <coughs> oh Galatians that have your minds muddled up with bad doctrine. You, you have your minds and somebody's whispering in your ears that now that you're saved you've got to help Jesus out and do something else to complete your salvation. The whole message of the book of Romans, the book of Hebrews, the book of Galatians, those three books of the Bible is that we're saved by faith. The just shall walk by faith, live by faith, have our salvation in faith. 
It's all about faith. And you saw, saw the word faith there several times as we're reading along. But even over in, I'll go ahead and read verse 6 through 9 that will be there today. Even as Abraham believed God, it's counted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore they, they which are of faith. The same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles through faith <coughs> preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In these shall the nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Guys, don't ever let anybody else tell you you are saved by faith alone. You're saved by the by knowing that Jesus Christ is your Savior. When you hear the gospel message, and the Holy Spirit enlightens your heart. Because no man can be saved unless the Spirit is drawing, unless the Father is drawing him. You can't just say, well, I'll wait till I'm 38 and I'll be saved. I'll wait till I'm 52. I, you no, know, no, no. You can only be saved when God's Spirit is drawing, when the Holy Spirit makes this alive in your heart, makes the Word alive in your heart. And when you have faith in Jesus Christ, you will repent of your sins. You'll know who Jesus Christ is. You're not saved by any works. Nothing. Nothing. You're saved by your faith in Jesus Christ. So, Galatians, who hath dulled your ears? Who hath clouded your mind? And the answer is, of course, the, the legalist, the Judaizer, that are saying that you've got to add something to salvation. Let, let me, I wrote this down, so I'll make sure I said this to you. Anything you have to add to Jesus is a falsehood. A supplemented Christ is a supplanted Christ. Amen. If you have to supplement Him with your works, you've, you've misplaced Him. If you have to uh, supplement Him and say, well, I'm not saved unless I get baptized, then you've supplanted Him as Lord. You said the baptism save you. I, I have to supplement Christ by making sure that I, I keep the dietary laws, then you've supplanted Christ. Oh, you foolish Galatians. Who hath, here's another good word, bewitched you. I like that word. And when I, I'm going to look out here and say, people of my age, what do you think of when you think about bewitched? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, nose twitching, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Samantha. So, Samantha, yes. <laughs> All right, so that, that, that dates who we are, okay? But it's not that kind of bewitched. It's literally the word an evil eye. They, like a lot of people even still today, think that snakes can look at their prey and, and can hypnotize them before they strike and kill the animal. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what some people believe. It's a, that's the word that's used here. Who has hypnotized your mind? When somebody hypnotizes you, I don't know if you've ever seen the hypnotist shows or anything, and they'll say, look into my eyes, or maybe you've seen that. Clean your mind out of everything else. Guys, I don't never want anything that tells me I've got to clean my mind out of everything else. I want to be thinking about Jesus Christ, thinking about what's going on in my life. That's why I think it's so sad that people get hooked on drugs and alcohol to try to escape, to clear their mind about the things that are going on. But anyhow, so who hath hypnotized your mind? Who hath clouded your ears? whispered in your ears, hypnotized your mind. And then what happens? Look at verse 3. That you should be dis that you should disobey the truth. Now I realize some of your translations don't have that in there. Another thing, that, now again, I use, I'm use. i not saying the King James is the only translation. I, guys, every time I, I use probably this passage of Scripture in particular, a tough passage in the Greek, I use the Greek and probably <laughs> 11 other translations. I'm preparing. But I noticed when I did that that the King James is one of the very few that puts this in there. That you should not obey the truth. When you get your mind clouded and hypnotized by the world, it starts causing you to be disobedient to Jesus Christ. That's why I warn you so many times of groups like the Jehovah Witnesses that say that there's another way to heaven, that Jesus is not the Son of God. Or the Mormons. Man, the Mormons, their commercials are so sweet, aren't they always family oriented? Say, I don't know if y'all know much about Mormons, but if you've ever been around Mormons, Mormons are really big on speaking in tongues and prophesying and uh, a lot of spiritual gifts, so called. And it's very exciting, the Mormons are. But they also say that Jesus Christ is not the only Son of God, that Lucifer is also the Son of God. My goodness, guys. Don't be sucked in, don't be hypnotized 
by the filth of the of the, uh, of the Mormons or Jehovah's Witness or even many right now of the charismatic movements that are trying to say, I'm not talking about old time Pentecostals, I'm talking about charismatics that are saying, you, you can't get this in Bible study. Listen, if you can't get it in Bible study, Brother Jeremy, I don't want it. Amen. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Right. Yes. You need to have this vision that only our church can explain to you. You've got to do this and that. Tell you, second issue, not only are you hypnotized and you don't obey the truth, second thing is you don't see Jesus any longer. Look what it says there in verse 1. Hath been evidently set forth. One, two, three, four. Five words in the English. One word in the Greek. Five words in English. Hath, hath been evidently set forth. That's a word, very short word, maybe seven or eight letters. It means put on a billboard. Everywhere Paul went, he preached Jesus so clearly. So openly, it was just like looking at a big poster, so something with shining lights on it. That Jesus Christ died for your sins. And the only hope you have is through the blood of Jesus Christ. That, and I like how the King James translates it, though, and several others translate it. Hath been evidently set forth, openly set forth, some translations have. What's set forth? That Christ is crucified among you. Don't be hypnotized by false teachers. You already see clearly. It's the way I think the uh, Neuromatic Standard may translate or NIV. You may have seen clearly that Christ is crucified among you. Christ is crucified among you. That's what we see, guys. It's well known that Jesus died for your sins, openly crucified for you. <laughs> so the first proof you have if you know Jesus Christ, I mean that you're saved, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the crucified one. The second one is this. It'll change. It. Yes. Is the Spirit of God is given to you. Verse 2 and 3. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. I'm going to quote some verses here to you. Actually, I wrote them down, so I'm not going to quote them. I'm going to read them to you. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. If you have not the Spirit, you're none of His. If you do not have the Spirit, you do not belong to Jesus. Another place, Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit Himself bears witness that you are the children of God. I like that. The Spirit Himself bears witness that you are the children of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This one, Ephesians chapter, chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. In Jesus, you also trusted. So Jesus is the first proof. After that, you heard the word of truth, the, the hearing of faith in Galatians, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Old Testament promise in the book of Jeremiah that, that was not for the Old Testament age. But he said there would be a new covenant made with the world. This new covenant would include everyone that knows him receiving the Spirit of God. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come on some people. And they would have the Holy Spirit indwelling them, but only for a short time. Not like that we have. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in you. Now, you say, well then Daniel, why do you preach that after you get saved, you need to let the Spirit of God fill you? Because after you get saved, I'm not talking about getting more of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about Him getting more of hold of you. I'm talking about Him getting more hold of you. That if you, when you get saved, you receive all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. In fact, let me read to you some other verses. It says this in 1 Corinthians 12. You're baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. John chapter 3. You're born of the Spirit. Let me read the next verse here in Ephesians. <coughs> Which the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession until the praise of His glory. What's that mean? He is the earnest. It means you have you carry around the receipt in your pocket, actually in your heart, that I have already been washed by the blood of Jesus. I don't need any of your garbage. I have a full, in, it paid in full is what my receipt says. And what is that receipt? The Holy Ghost in me. 
How long will I have the Holy Spirit in me until the day of redemption, until the day that I go to be with Him? Then I'll see the Spirit of God as John did in the book of Revelation. Till that purchased possession is mine. No. When you get saved, you receive all the Holy Spirit you're going to receive. But I like Ephesians chapter 5 where it says, but be ye being filled with the Spirit. Be ye being filled. That means it happens over and over and over again. And I'll say this to you. If you're following the Lord and you say, well, I don't really think much about Jesus or I'm not really very faithful to Jesus. I don't really like to read my Bible. Blah, 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 blah. Guys, ask God to give you a fresh feeling of the Holy Ghost. He says this, that He will give to those that ask Him. James says, if any of you lack wisdom, I guarantee you the Holy Ghost will bring you wisdom. Let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and does not hold back. The King James upbraideth not. He does not hold it back. Hallelujah. So, the Spirit is given to you salvation. How did this happen? By the law? No, not by the law. No one was born again until Jesus Christ came and died on the cross of Calvary. You say, well, people were saved in the Old Testament. Yes, they were. They were saved by faith, looking forward to the day that Jesus Christ would pay for their sins. <coughs> I read to you, we're, we're going to get to this Lord's will and next time we're in, in Galatians. It says the scripture says this in verse 8. Preach before the gospel unto Abraham. When did the gospel of Jesus get preached to Abraham? I will tell you so you can read it for yourself. Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Don't look at it right now. Wait till you go home. I'm preaching right now, okay? Wait until you go home. Genesis chapter 22. First time in the Bible where the word love is mentioned, even though <laughs> the world has been around for over 2,000 years. The flood has already happened. First time in the Bible the word worship is mentioned. First time in the Bible, are you ready for this? The word lamb is mentioned. Wow. Thousands of years of history. But Genesis 22. Boom. It explodes on the scene. Jesus even said in John, Abraham longed to see my day. And then it says this, and he saw it. Abraham saw Jesus' day. Hallelujah. So they were saved by faith, but they didn't get the Spirit by the law. No, 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 no. How did they get the Spirit the same way we do? By the hearing of faith, verse 2. Now, if we receive the Holy Spirit when we're saved, and this happened by faith and not by the law, the third thing up there is this. How do we continue in our salvation? By faith, church. Not by our works. I love what James says. James says, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. But he didn't say your works is what kept you saved. It just means when you do your works, others can see your heavenly Father and give Him the glory. Jesus said, let them see my Father in you, that you're the light of the world, set upon a hill that cannot be hid. Don't put your life under a bushel, he says in another place. Work because you are saved. But you're not saved by your work. You're not kept by your work. You continued, verse 3. Are you so <coughs> foolish, muddle-minded? Are you so clouded by false teaching? Have you begun in the Spirit? The answer, of course, is yes. Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Are you made perfect by letting someone take your uh, and circumcise you? Cut away your flesh. Do you think that's how you get perfect with God? Is by being circumcised? And then he applies that well, at, later on in chapter 3 and 4 to all, not just the circumcision, but any parts of the law that you think you have to keep the animal sacrifice. You can offer lambs and goats and bulls. Jesus Christ's blood paid for it all, church. I hope you're excited about this. Proof that you're saved. Number one is Jesus Christ died for you. Number two, the Spirit of God lives in you. Huh. And the Spirit of God lives in you. Our spiritual birth, I didn't know if I was going to share this with you or not, but when I sat into my study on Friday, I started thinking about how, how can I illustrate this? This may not be a good illustration, but it's what I've got, Calvin. When a baby is born, you don't have a baby and then say, I think I'll take my baby back and get in the mouth next week. Two weeks later, I'll get some feetsies. No, when a baby is born, if everything's right, it has its mouth, it has eyes and feet and all those sort of things, okay? And all new births, I promise you, are right. <laughs> There's no miscarriages, no bad births. Well, that's how silly it is to say, I get saved, 
But now I'll get more saved by my baptism. I'll get more saved by my circumcision. I'll get more saved by not cutting my hair, ladies. I'll get more saved by not having hair on my face, guys. All these are things I hear preached in Mingo County. Probably in McDowell County, too. I just don't go to as many of y'all's churches. If, you, if you're a true Christian, you're clean shaven. If you're a true Christian, you wear your hair up in a bun and you don't never cut your hair. If you're a true Christian, this guys, let me tell you what. You don't get saved and then go back and get added to your salvation. When you get saved, you get saved by the blood of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit enters into you. And then you live your sanctified life. Sanctification just means holiness. You live your holy life. Because when you get saved, you get moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of holiness. We call that positional sanctification. Then, I know you say, well, I've heard this a thousand times since you've been our pastor. You might hear a thousand more before the Lord is coming. And I hope He don't. I hope He comes and gets us today. But another thing is, then you're progressively sanctified by living out the Word of God in your community, in your families. Then someday we'll be perfectly sanctified. We'll go to be with Jesus. We'll have that complete redemption of our purchase. Hallelujah. And I look forward to that. All right, what's our third proof? Our, our final proof today. That is the Father. All right. Proof of God the Father. <coughs> verse 4 and 5. Have you suffered so many things in vain? Now, I, I know if you have any other translation of the King James, it don't say suffer. It says experienced. And that's really what the word is. It can be translated suffering, but it should be translated experience here. Have you experienced so many things in vain? Did the Holy Spirit come in you in vain? Did, did, did Jesus Christ's blood wash your sins away in vain? You have so many things. Are all those empty? Go back up to verse 21, the chapter before. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, here's the most scariest words in Scripture, then Christ is dead in vain. Jesus died for nothing. Same thing is being said here. Have you experienced all these things and it's nothing? If you think you've got to add something to your salvation, then I love what Paul has his hope. I hope so much more of you Galatians. If it be yet in vain, don't let it be in vain. Your experience, you've been justified just as if you'd never sinned. Paul, Paul is using their experience, faith, knowledge, the experience with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now I know we must be careful when we talk about people's experiences that need to be backed up by the Word. That's why after he does these five verses, he's going to spend many verses, 24, let's see, about 50 more verses, <coughs> chapter 3 and 4, talking about the Word of God. Because anytime somebody tells you they have an experience with God and it don't match up with the Word, you run away from that right there. If they tell you they've got experience with God that don't match up with the Word. But let me tell you this about this experience. Not in vain. I can say that about me. I hope I can say that about you. It's hard to argue with a man or a woman or a boy or a girl who's experienced the love of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So someone's experienced the forgiveness of Jesus washing over their souls and their sins are being taken away. And it's not in vain. If you know Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Ghost, it is not in vain. Have you experienced so many things in vain? Verse 5. Our last verse for today. God, He, therefore, that ministers to you the Spirit. That's a good translation of the King James, even though I think every other translation I checked, including the New King James, said provides or accomplishes or greatly abundantly gives. The word minister is good. It, 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 it's, it's, if you understand what the word means, it's an old English word. It means to give beyond measure. <coughs> when you say someone ministered to my heart, you mean they give to you beyond measure. He, God therefore, provides above measure to you the Spirit and worketh, <coughs> continues to work miracles among you. Doeth he by, by the works of the law? No. Or by the hearing of faith? Yes. Church, God 
We, look, look at verse 2. This is very interesting. This would I only learn of you. Received ye the Spirit. See that? Received ye. And then you go down to verse 5. God provided it. Both are true. When people say, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you do it all by yourself? Well, it, I received it. <laughs> Somebody else couldn't receive it for me. <laughs> I don't mean it, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's a person. I mean, I couldn't receive that feeling for myself. But let me tell you what, guys. I also don't always know this, Brother Lee. God provided it. God, I didn't do it. God provided it. In fact, He provided it abundantly above measure. This word minister is used five times in the Bible. Here's one of them. I'll, if you want to turn with me, you're welcome to. I'm going to go to the book of Second uh, Peter and show you two more. So you'll have three of the five already down. Five times this word is used. And here I'm going to give you two of the others. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. And besides this, giving all diligence, add, there's that word, minister, means abundantly supply, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. So besides this, once you're saved, give yourself completely to God. Give all diligence, all of your power, to abundantly supply to your faith virtue and virtue <coughs> knowledge. And in the same chapter, let me make sure I get the right verse here. In the same chapter, verse 11, listen to this. For so an entrance shall be ministered, there's our word, supplied abundantly, unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Man, what a thing. We are abundantly put into the everlasting kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say hallelujah. Praise His holy name what we have in Jesus Christ. The third proof is a proof of God. God the Father is a proof. He provides the Holy Spirit to us, supplies it abundantly and He works miracles in you. And I want to stop there. Because there's so much false teaching today where people say God doesn't work miracles today. I want you to know the Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday. Come on. Today. Forever. Forever. Forevermore. Tomorrow. According to which translation you have. So he is, he is the same today. To yesterday, today, tomorrow, forevermore. He never changes. And we read about the miracles that Jesus Christ did on earth. We read about the miracles in the book of Acts that his followers performed. Let me tell you what, he has not changed. He has not changed. You heard Sister Katie talk about a miracle in her own life. God does that stuff. Sister Cheryl, when the doctor said, we'll try this on you, got about a 2% chance it'll work. God blessed her. That's God. I don't know how many times we anointed Sister Cheryl with oil. We anointed her and anointed her. Time after time after time. And I know she aches for that today. Because Brother Mike said, wanted us to make sure the church remembered her. Tomorrow she's going back for, for her checkup again. Pray, guys. And what about <coughs> what about little Brene? You remember that, don't you, Bill? Oh. When the doctors say, oh, this, this baby ain't going to live. Just kill this baby. Let it, abort this baby. And my goodness, not only she's alive, she's beautiful. And like all of your kids, taller than a tree and giant. <laughs> and beautiful and smart and, and so much joy to be around. You tell me God is not real? Amen. I tell you, look. Look in the mirror. See what God did for you. Maybe you don't have a miracle as big as Brene or Katie or, or, or Sister Cheryl. Or you may. I don't know your, all, all your testimony. But I know this. The same God that provides the Holy Spirit abundantly for you, He worketh, continues to work miracles among you. That, that word doesn't really mean among the group of you. It's, it's a personal word. It's a singular. Among you. In you. Be a good way. In fact, 2,000 times that's how the word is translated. In you. Almost 2,000 times. In you. In you. In you. God works miracles in you. And what He has done in, in you, saving your soul from hell, washing you away from your filthy sins, forgiving us daily, Brother Ray, when we fail Him. All we do is say, Lord, please forgive me. And you really mean it. And He does forgive you. Just as if it had never happened. He wipes it away. Oh, church. I love these proofs. So I want to 
just skip over the next one there. And we'll save it for next week. Verse 6 through 9. But actually that just introduces what's going to happen in the rest of the next two chapters here. Alright, so then we come to our last one here. Alright guys. Proof that we're saved. What is the proof that we're saved? Well, we accepted Jesus Christ by faith. The Holy Spirit abundantly given to us and we received it. Received the hopes, received Him. The power of God the Father every day in our lives. The Bible promises on salvation. Uh, well, I'm going to ask you this question. Are you right with God today? Are you righteous with God? To be righteous means you have a right standing. The greatest need of all mankind, the only need of all mankind, every human being that's ever been born, the greatest need is this. Are you right with God? Do you have a right standing with God? You can know that you have. You don't have to guess about it. You don't say, I hope I'm saved. You can know that you're saved. Now, right, Sister Carlos, she would come back to the piano. We're going to sing the first and second verse this, this morning. Give you an opportunity. If you don't know Christ as Savior, to be saved today. If you do know Christ as Savior, to draw to Him. Draw close to Him. Draw close to Jesus. Our children are coming back to take communion with us. Let's stand together as we sing this morning. Yes, he is. If you're watching today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, today you can know Jesus. Today you can have your sins all washed away. You can know that heaven is your home. There's nothing between you and Jesus. Today is the day of salvation. Our nation had a great celebration yesterday. Celebrate Veterans Day. You can have a celebration today. And say, I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. Today, you can know Him in the free part of sin. today and you come to know Christ as Savior, I do ask you to contact us. We don't want anything from you. We'll give you a free Bible, some literature, nothing from you. Even if you don't live in this area, we want to know that you've heard the gospel. We'll put you on our prayer list. We'll pray for you. Lift you up to God. Today is the day of salvation.